Okay, so Acts chapter 11, if you'll turn there, is where we're starting this morning. So again, what we're doing here is a study of the book of Acts, you know, chapter by chapter right through. And for the most part, we're just about getting a chapter a week. Um, and just to lay it out here on the timeline, when you look at the Bible as a history book, as a timeline, if you start right back here at Genesis, first book of the Bible, through Malachi, the last book of the Bible, then picks up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it starts with the birth of Christ through to the crucifixion. And of course we've got Matthew, what, what we call the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Talking about this 33-year period, uh, the birth of Christ until the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, so we've got about 4,000 years here in Genesis to Malachi. Um, and then the book of Acts picks up. And of course in Acts 1 we started with the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. And then Peter and the Twelve get on with the um, starting the church at Jerusalem. The church of God at Jerusalem. So we're in Acts 11. I'll just put that right here, Acts 11. Of course, Acts 9 is where this guy, Paul, was saved. Or at that time, at this time, he's still Saul. It's not until Acts 13 his name will be changed from Saul to Paul. <coughs> Pardon me. And with that being said, let's get started with our study of uh, Acts chapter 11. Now, of course, last week, Acts chapter 10. That was the first time in your Bible that one of the twelve went to a Gentile. And Acts 10 was all about uh, Peter going to Cornelius. And I do want to just back up into Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Okay, so... He was doubting some of these things. Um, come to so Peter goes in. He he addresses them. Verse twenty seven. Now, so as he this would be Peter. As Peter talked with him, Cornelius the Gentile, he went in and found many that were come together, and he said unto them. So Cornelius, so Peter saying unto Cornelius and the people that Cornelius had assembled. So Peter says, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Then in verse 29, at the end, Therefore came I unto you without gain, saying, As soon as I was sent for, I ask therefore for what intent ye have sent for me. So Peter did not know why he was there. Come on, this is Peter, the guy with the king that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was on earth, gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven, right? And yet Peter's saying, you know, why have you sent for me? Why am I here? So Peter did not know, because he was it was an unlawful thing for him to be in front of a Gentile. So here we are, clear to Acts chapter 10. So what that says to you all the way up until Acts 10. It was an unlawful thing for a Jew to be with a Gentile. Okay, You can't miss it. That had started way back here. Genesis chapter 12. The promise to a guy named Abraham. I'll bless them that bless thee. I'll curse them that curse thee. The Jews became God's chosen people right there in Genesis 12. And it continued all the way through up until this time. Acts chapter 10. First time Peter is going. And go back and study last week, you know, when we were studying Acts 10 and that whole uh, passage, you know, we, we read the passages back here in the book of Matthew, where the Lord Jesus Christ told the twelve, go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We look at, that was Matthew chapter 10. We look at Matthew 15, where when Peter, or when Christ the Gentile woman came to him, and, and said, Lord, help me. My daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. And the Lord Jesus Christ ignored her first. Then the twelve said, send her away. And then he insults her, calls her a dog, basically. Not basically, he did. He says, not me to cast the bread to the, the children's bread to the dogs. 
And she says, truth, Lord. You know, but uh, uh, she recognized her place, and then he did help her eventually, but the third time. Okay, so he was, it's just consistent, right from Genesis 12 all the way up here to Acts 10. The Jews are God's chosen people at that time, not today in 2013. And we'll put 2013 here. We'll be getting to some of this. You know, so why, why study the book of Acts the way we're doing? Because this is the key to understanding your Bible. This one book, the book of Acts, helps us understand the transition from the Jews being God's chosen people to the doctrine for the church, which is the body of Christ, because all that really matters is what's important in the year 2013. You know, as, as I say just about every week, if you died tonight, where would you go? And why would you go there? Because that's that's what matters today. You know, we're either saved or we're not, and we want to make sure that we're studying to get the right gospel for our salvation. Because there are many gospels throughout the Bible. Okay. So now back to Acts eleven. Back to now to Acts eleven. We haven't started yet. Okay, so, uh, 11.1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, Jews, contended with him. Contended with him, okay? Notice that word. Contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and did eat, eat with them. Okay? Well, first of all, who in the world questions Peter? Remember, he was the one that was given the keys to the kingdom. He was the chief of the apostles, if you will. And yet these guys are... Peter obviously did something, I'm going to say, wrong enough, according to the law, for the rest to question him. That's what verse 3 is. You know, Thou witness in to men uncircumcised, to Gentiles. And he ate with them, furthermore. You know, unheard of, unlawful. As Peter said in Acts 10, it was unlawful for him to do that. Things are changing. It's a transition. Remember, in the book of Acts, never, ever, ever get your doctrine from the book of Acts. You're going to see so many different doctrines. You can see tongues at the beginning, yet at the end of Acts, tongues are done away with. You see healings throughout Acts, but yet by the end of Acts, healings are done. You see different Gospels for salvation. And especially when it comes to Paul. Okay, don't, don't do what you see Paul doing in the book of Acts. Your doctrine is what Paul writes in the 13 books that he wrote. Romans through Philemon. Okay, the, you know, Romans, the book that comes right after the book of Acts. The next 13 books. And when you figure there's 27 books in the New Testament... 13 divided by 27. If we have any math majors out there, you can tell us that's almost half. Almost half of the books of the New Testament are written by Paul, and yet most of us, when I say us, most churches this morning on a Sunday morning, ignore what Paul says. And they, they live in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and ignore what Paul says, and he wrote half the New Testament. And that's why we study the book of Acts, to see that transition. Okay, so verse 3, they're questioning Peter. Verse 4, But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying... And of course, now Peter is going to go back and, and tell the whole story of Acts 10, and we are going to read it because we're studying this verse by verse. Verse 5, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened my eyes, I considered, and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. Okay, the, the Jews had very strict dietary laws. And, of course, the analogy here also is to Gentiles being common and unclean. That's what we were considered at that time. Again, at this time in history, we Gentiles were common, unclean people compared to the Jews. 
still uh, we're still over. Go right in still. <laughs> yeah, for that matter, we yeah. still. We didn't change, the Jews did. All right, we're still what we were. The Jews are no longer God's chosen people. Uh, they became, at the, at, at the end of the book of Acts, Acts 28, the Jews become, Lo am I, not my people. Okay? So that's what changed. So good point, Brian. We're, we still are, basically. I hate this sinless and, and you know not worth the gunpowder to take the blow of sin to hell basically and, and the Jews for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God the Jews right? still think the same way and they Nobody absolutely does. do verse 9 but the, but the voice answered me again from heaven what God hath cleansed that call thou not common and this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven and behold immediately there went three men all there were three men already come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Remember, Peter brought six people with him, six Jews, if you will, with him, into this man's house, Cornelius' house, verse 13. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood up and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Therefore, you know right there that Cornelius was lost. Okay, that's a big issue to some people, whether he was saved ahead of time or not. According to that right there, Cornelius was not yet saved before Peter went to to him. Verse 15, And as I, began to, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. So remember, Acts chapter 2 is what he's referring to. Hold your hand here and just flip back to Acts 2. I'm just going to read the first few verses here in Acts chapter 2. We'll actually start uh, right in Acts 2, uh, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from, a, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's your phrase right there. They were all filled in Acts 2, 3. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay? So how did people know that they had the gift of the Holy Ghost at that time? They spake with tongues. And again, today we have how many denominations that would have you speaking in tongues today because that's what they did here in Acts 2 because that's what happened in Acts 10. Um, jump ahead to Acts 10. Acts 10. So Peter just said in Acts 11, uh, in Acts 11:15, we just read, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Okay, so we just read Acts 2. That was the beginning that Peter was referring to. Go back to Acts 10, verse 44. So this is when. Peter was speaking to Cornelius. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to add for the first time in your Bible, that was the first time that would have happened. Verse 46, how did they know that? For, that's the first word in 46. For, if you will, because of, because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. Okay, so that's where you have the, the Pentecostal movement today that says you've got to speak in tongues to know that you have, you got the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if you don't speak in tongues, then you didn't get the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, yes, that was true in Acts 10, in Acts 2, in Acts 10, in that time period. But as Paul tells us later, where there are tongues, they will cease. Okay, everything ended at the end of Acts. All of these doctrines ended at the end of the book of Acts. That's why we're studying 
Acts chapter by chapter, verse by verse. You've got to see the transition so that you get the right doctrine for the year 2013. Okay? Amen. That's the key. Okay, so that again, that's why we're going through verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And it, it, again, when people take things, I'm going to say out of context, I remember one of our core principles of how to study your Bible, context. You've got to take things in context. Who's saying it? To whom are they speaking? What comes before? What comes after? Under what circumstances? Context. I I always loved this. Uh, Brother Art Watkins used to uh, give this definition. I'm going to write the word um, context this way. Con and text to just make the, the emphasis on... So it's one word, context. But, as he said, if you take the text out of context, you're left with nothing but a con. And how true that is. And that's what happens all across pulpits in America today. Not necessarily willingly and knowingly, which is a shame, but, but if, if they're not taking some things in context... And if, if, if they would take it in context, like right here, like Acts 2, okay, it was a ministry of Peter and the twelve to the Jews. Okay, we're not Jews in this room. So why would we, you know, it, we couldn't put ourselves under the Jewish doctrine at that time anyway today. It would do no good. But that's what, if you don't, if you don't go to the right areas for your doctrine, Romans to Philemon, Paul tells us 17 times, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. We are Gentiles. Okay, that's why we have to go to Romans to Philemon. But I want you to understand why. Don't ever take my word for that. Don't take any man's word, any teacher's word. You've got to see it in the Bible. Okay? Um, hold here. Go to Acts chapter 17. You need to be like these people right here that we're about to read about. A second principle in how we study the Bible today. Acts chapter 17, I'm going to read three verses. I'm going to start in verse 10. Acts 17 and verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. Now I want you to be like these Bereans. Okay? And you'll see why in a minute. Brother Jerry Lockhart calls his church Berean Bible Church. This is why. It's a great principle by which you should study the Word. Brother... Um, E.C. Moore called his church Berean Bible Church for the same reason. So let's read. Uh, By night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Did you catch that phrase? These Bereans are called, your Bible calls them, more noble than the Thessalonians. Well, why? Let's read. In that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and search the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. That's why right there, that's the principle you need to be. Receive the Word with all readiness of mind, because you search the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Search it out. I assure you, I'm always going to teach you what I think is right doctrine by the Word of God. But I am human, I may make a mistake. I do make mistakes. I don't mean I don't make... I do make mistakes. I, I, I assure you I try not to. Not to with the Word of God, for sure. But you've got to see it in Scriptures. That's the point. Matter of fact, let's read verse 12. Therefore, many of them believe. Don't believe it until you see it in Scripture. All right? When I teach you something, okay, He taught me something, I'm not sure I see that in Scripture yet. Don't believe it then. Wait until you study it out Search the Scriptures daily, study it out, and once you see it in Scriptures, then you will believe. Just like these Bereans. Therefore, many of them believe. Okay, That is absolutely key for you and your family. So I always say, I, I encourage every family here, as a family, to sit down and write your own statement of faith. You know, we believe. And what are the things you believe? Put them down there. And put the verses in the Bible why you believe what you do. 
And I'll just use tongues as a for instance. You know, we believe that, that tongues are not for today. Okay, well obviously you're not going to put Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10 in there because tongues were for that time period. You're going to put in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where Paul explains tongues were for a sign to them that um, did not believe. They were signed to the Jews. And also he said that tongues would cease. Where there are tongues, they will cease in 1 Corinthians 13. And sure enough, they do cease at the end of the book of Acts. All right? Of course, the most important one is your doctrine for salvation. We believe as a family, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, how that when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on that cross back there, He shed His blood to pay the penalty in those three key words, right? For our sins. For our sins. Thank you. Okay? How Christ died for our sins. According to the Scriptures, He was buried, took those sins to hell, and three days later, God the Father raised Him for our justification. And as Ephesians 1.13, I would put there, when, I be, when a person believes that Gospel of Christ and trusts in that Gospel of Christ for their salvation, that's when they're saved, and then the next doctrine or tenant to your doctrine you might add is seal, eternal security. Ephesians 1.13 says, when we're saved, we're sealed unto the day of redemption. How long is that? Ephesians 4.30 tells us the day of redemption is when you know, what people call the rapture of the church, the calling out of the body of Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 you would put there okay, for your statement of faith. But the most important doctrine, because all that matters, it doesn't matter if you know if tongues are for us or not. It doesn't matter if you know about where to find the rapture. What matters is, is there a day when you put your trust in the Gospel of Christ for your salvation? Is there a day when you realize there is nothing you can do to get good enough, to dress your flesh up good enough, to gain favor with God Almighty? There's a moment in time we realize, Lord, there's nothing I can do to save myself. Yeah, I can stop drinking, stop smoking, stop chewing, stop, 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 and do this and do Not of work. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 would be another one. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? It is total faith alone, grace alone, Grace, unmerited favor. It's a free gift. It's available to anyone that will believe it and trust in it for their salvation. At any time. At 2 o'clock in the morning, they could, they could trust in it and, and get saved at that point. But the moment they get saved, as Ephesians 1.13 says, they're sealed into the day of redemption. Nothing you can do to earn your salvation. And praise the Lord, nothing you can do to lose it. You mean if I do this or I do that, even you know the most heinous acts you can think of? Yeah, that's right. Because when he died, he died what? For our sins. Just the bad sins? Well, sin is sin, right? All sin. Colossians, keep your hand here. Flip to the right, and I'll come to you there, George. And, I, and let's come to the right about five or six books or so to Colossians. Romans and Corinthians, then Galatians, then Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 2. To get to the Thessalonian and Timothy letters, you've gone too far. Colossians chapter 2. He's going to show you how many, the Bible's going to tell you how many of your sins he died for. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, and it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you. How many trespasses? All, all trespasses. And all means what? All. all. All your trespasses were forgiven. At this event in history, about 2,000 years ago, when the Lord Jesus Christ hung on that cross and shed His blood to pay the penalty for all our sins, all of your sins. He then went to hell, took all of your sins to hell. He left them there and God the Father raised Him on the third day for our justification. 
should we stop sinning? We should sure try, but are we going to continue sinning? We sure are. We're still in this flesh. Even after we get saved, we're still here in this flesh. That's the difference in, in the Gospel that Paul writes to us is that Christ died for all of our sins. And the moment we put our trust and faith in that and that alone, we're saved and sealed unto the day of redemption. That's what matters for those of you on the internet. You know, study this whole series on the book of Acts and understand all the other doctrines and where they come and where they leave and why. But all that matters, all that, all that has anything to do with your eternity, is this day your moment of salvation. And as Paul says in, in Romans 5, there is a moment of salvation, a day of salvation for each and every one of us. Okay? Either there's a day when we saw ourselves as a lost sinner doomed for hell, nothing we could do to save ourselves, and if you will, not worth the gunpowder to take the blow us into hell. But we, put, we, we heard the Gospel preached, and we put our faith and trust in the Gospel of Christ and got saved right then and there, wherever we were. Again, it could be in a car at a red light, realizing, wow, I'm a lost sinner of the Lord. I'm receiving that gift which saved me right now. I'm going to receive that gift of eternal life right then and there. It is that easy. We're lying in bed at night. Okay, anywhere, anytime. Okay, back to Acts 11 now. So write that. I, again, families, I encourage you to do that as a family together. Until you see, Don't believe things until you see it in Scripture. It's clear in your mind. Yep, believe that. Check it off. Put it on our statement of faith. You know, maybe keep a second column over here. These are things we think we believe, but we don't have enough Scripture yet to believe it. So I can't put it in my statement of faith until I have enough Scripture to, to support that belief. Okay, so Acts 11... We were on verse 15, so let's make sure we pick it up again. Acts 11, 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that He said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, by the way, in verse 16 right there, how many baptisms were there in that verse? Praise. Two. There's baptism with water. There's baptism with the Holy Ghost. There's two right there. Back in Matthew, there's the third one in one verse. You know, and with fire, baptism of fire. Okay. So there are. Once again, there's many gospels. There's many baptisms in your Bible. But yet Paul tells us there's only one baptism. Right. Remember, we I think we even studied that last week, and I think that was in here. Uh, Ephesians chapter four. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. For those of you on the internet, I encourage you to figure out which one that is. By the way, Paul also says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Well, there's your baptism. It's by the Spirit. Verse 17 of Acts 11, For as much then as God gave them the like gift, as He did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Interesting there that Peter says, what was I, not who was I. Remember, Peter, the man given the keys to the kingdom. And he said, you know, he already had the authority. He was given the kings. Whatsoever thou shalt buy, bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Peter had that authority. But yet he says, what was I? Uh, what was I that I could withstand God. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Gang, you can't miss it right there. <coughs> the disciples, the Jews. Okay, when I say the Jews, the converted Jews, the Jews that are following the doctrine that Peter and the Twelve were teaching, right here and now, Acts chapter 11, verse 18, for the first time in history are seen that God hath now allowed, if you will, opened up, as He says right there, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Before this time, before Acts chapter you know, 10, 11, when this happens, 
the Gentiles had not been granted repentance in their life unless they were blessing Israel. Let's make sure there was a way they could do that. Okay? But on their own, there was not a way for that to occur up until this time in hit throughout since Genesis 12. For thousand years, there had not yet been that time. Okay? So here it opens up. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, the stoning of Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only, as they all thought was the right way to do it. Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians concerning the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. Underline that phrase in there. Okay, The church of the twelve started. And they sent... So what came to their ears? Verse 21, that... In 20 and 21, that people of the Grecians, so Gentiles. Verse 18. Verse and you had a... And verse 18, thank you. I, I missed your question. We'll get it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. 23, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with, the, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, when Barnabas found Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I want to make a note of that out on your side there. Let me ask you about that when... Uh, 25 then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. I have a note that says the switch, and that is referencing not mentioning Peter for a while or at all Tarsus or what? Close, but not quite. We're going to see one more with Peter, but for the most part, between Acts 11 and Acts 12, Peter, the last time Peter addresses anybody is Acts 12, with the exception of Acts 15 when Paul comes to see him. The meeting there. So yes, we're about there. Okay. Okay, twenty-seven. And in these days, in these days, uh, came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did and sent it by the elders, or sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Okay? So Barnabas and Paul are taking this collection that they took up for the money. Now think about it. What was going on in Acts chapters 2, 3, 4, 5? Remember they were selling out, having all things common? All right. They thought the tribulation was coming. They thought that this seven-year period of great tribulation was coming because they knew then it would be the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth to set up His, His kingdom. They thought that was coming. They sold out. Therefore, we're now a couple years later. They no longer have the money. They run out of everything. They thought the trip was coming. They sold out like they were told to, but things changed or are changing. Therefore, they take up collections here for the church at Jerusalem, which had sold out and is now basically out of money, and they send it by the hands of Barnabas and Paul back to them. Okay, so that would be the end of Acts 11. We're going to take a, about a 15-minute break here, but question earlier. Uh, uh, referring back to, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and Ephesians 8 and 9 about salvation, uh, I was talking to somebody about uh, once you are saved and sealed, uh, God sees no sin. Yes. And he said, find that in the Bible. I said, well, you know, I can't. <laughs> yeah. 
But I knew it was there. Yeah, so is there a verse that says, uh, it says God cannot look upon sin. No. All right, we are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and that would be the probably the best uh, verse I would use right there. You know, he, he Which verse is look, this? I, I have to get that Okay, we'll talk yeah. later. Uh, and see, I had thought that I had seen in Scripture the phrase, the season of sin. The phrase itself, and I was on a sword. I think it's around. look upon. What's that? He cannot look upon would yeah. be the phrase. I couldn't find the season now. Okay. <laughs> One thing about that program, you've got to type in the exact words that, yeah. are, that are in there. It doesn't... Um, yeah. But, uh, okay. And then, um, the other question I have. Everybody will. So Acts and Romans and Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 while, while you're getting your next one. George, you grab your question. I'm just going here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just based on what you just said there too, one other verse I just wanted to grab, which um, in 2 Corinthians, I said 5. Actually, let's go to 6 first of all. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, it's all in parentheses. And notice he says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation, there's your day of salvation, have I secured thee. Behold, now, and underline that word now, I have it highlighted in mine with the yellow highlighter. The word now is the accepted time. Behold, now, and I highlighted it again there. Now is the day of salvation. All right. Now, while you're there, I want to grab the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 and 21. Think about the crucifixion here when we read 19. To wit, that God was in Christ. So while He's hanging on that cross, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 21. For he, God, hath made him Christ. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Every one of you has a testimony of salvation. You have the righteousness of God in him. You have Christ's righteousness accounted unto you. You are righteous. Not by anything you did or didn't do. Simply by what you believe and trusted. You have the righteousness of God accounted to you. Have any question now? I didn't. It's alright. We'll do okay. it. Right. It was something off segment. Okay, great. Alright, on that note then, Brian, we'll stop the recording here. Take a 15 minute break.